We've been going through a series uh, on the topic of spiritual growth. Uh, in our passage this morning, John 14, we're going to look at the person and work of the Holy Spirit uh, as it applies to our growth. And this is a topic that it's, uh, you can't exhaust it in one sermon. Right? Uh, there's a lot to unpack. So really, my intent this morning is to uh, open up the conversation, uh, to provoke curiosity, uh, for some of you and for others to encourage and maybe even re-energize uh, you and your faith. Uh, as a brief aside, uh, one of the things we're going to do after service uh, is to have a, a Q&A uh, for those interested and willing and able, um, where we're really just going to uh, talk through a bit more on the sermon, uh, questions you might have, concerns, uh, and really it's an opportunity as a community to uh, interpret, right, Scripture together, right? This idea of hermeneutics, right, interpreting Scripture is not just work of the teacher or the pastor, right, but it's, it's also intended to be a communal exercise, right, uh, and, I, and a, a space to, for iron to sharpen one another. And so that time will be opened up for those that are uh, able and interested, uh, and we'll do that only for a half hour or so. Um, the hope is that it can even just start to prime uh, conversations uh, that may continue on this week as you meet in life groups and Bible studies and things of that nature. So John chapter 14, uh, verses 15 to 26. This passage in John uh, comes in a section known as the Farewell Discourse, John chapter 14 to 17. At the time when Christ is addressing his disciples shortly before uh, his crucifixion. If you love me, you will keep my commands. And I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth. The world is unable to receive him because it doesn't see him or know him. But you do know him because he remains with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you will live too. On that day, you will know that I am in my Father. You are in me, and I am in you. The one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father I also will love him and reveal myself to him. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it you're going to reveal yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. The one who doesn't love me will not keep my words. The word that you hear is not mine, but it's from the father who sent me. I have spoken these things to you while I remain with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have told you. This is the reading of God's Word. There's often a discrepancy between what we say we believe and how we actually live. One of my previous part-time jobs was as a high school soccer coach at a small Christian school. And I had an opportunity to coach uh, the boys' varsity team. Now, this was a small school uh, that didn't have many athletes. We didn't really attract a lot of athletes. So whoever showed up, that's your team. Right? So I was there for several years. Uh, and one particular year going into the new season, uh, we got word that there was this kid from Europe that was coming to the school. And uh, through communication with my athletic director, uh, I saw the emails that he, uh, this particular kid, was sending to us. And he was sharing how not only did he love soccer, but he was good at it. And he played competitively. And so in my mind, as I'm hearing this news, I'm thinking, you know, is it too soon to start thinking that we're going to be state champions, <laughs> right? We're about to get a kid from Europe 
who not only loves soccer, but is good at it. So I was getting excited. And the team, right, because it's a small school, word travels fast, they're also getting excited as well. And then the big reveal came, the first day of practice. And within 30 seconds, it was clear that this kid had slightly over-exaggerated his talent. Okay. It was uncoordinated. Right. Skills you would expect someone who's been playing soccer for a while to have, he did not have. He didn't know where to be in the field positionally. He was not good. Okay. <laughs> it was not good. Very disappointing for a coach <laughs> to see. Right. There's no doubt in my mind that this kid uh, truly believed that he was a good soccer player. Uh, but it was detached from the reality of what actually was the case. I haven't served in uh, several different evangelical Protestant churches kind of 30 years. Uh, one of the observations I've noticed is when it comes to the Holy Spirit, uh, our relationship uh, to him is like that of this kid and his experience in relationship to soccer. We might believe in the Holy Spirit in one form or another, but that belief is detached from the reality of our day-to-day. -day. Or to put it another way, it seems as if it doesn't really make much of a difference whether the Holy Spirit is a part of your day or not. No difference how you worked or studied, no difference how you treated family or friends or neighbors, no difference how you rested or played, how you engaged, differing opinions or ideas, no difference whatsoever. So it begs the question, why do we need the Holy Spirit? After all, we have our wits about us, we have our health, we have YouTube and Facebook. Why would we need the Spirit of Christ? And briefly, the answer is spiritual maturity and all that comes with life in Christ is impossible to attain without the Holy Spirit. Spiritual maturity is impossible without the Holy Spirit. I'm going to share three points, and again, this is intended to open the conversation. First point is the Holy Spirit is a gift from the Father and the Son. The second point is the Holy Spirit lives in those that put their faith in Christ. The third point is that the work of the Holy Spirit is many, but it's ultimately about pointing you to Christ and magnifying the love of Christ in and through your life. I don't know what tradition you come from when it comes to this subject of the Holy Spirit. I've seen at least two views. One is what you can call a low view of the Holy Spirit. This is a view that acknowledges the person uh, and work of the Spirit, uh, but outside of acknowledging him, doesn't really speak much about him uh, or share experiences uh, that come about through life in him. He's just sort of a footnote in your life. All right? In some congregations, it really boils down to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scripture. But there's no spirit to be found anywhere. Right. The other view is one you can think of as a very charismatic view, and that is it's very spiritual. Everything is spiritual. Right. You can't do anything without him, And it's almost to a point where your mark as a Christian comes about by baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is to be demonstrated through speaking in tongues. I'm not sure which side you tend towards. Right. But what I want to say is that Scripture doesn't give you the option to be dismissive of the Spirit of God. Right. And even in our passage we're seeing that you need him. You need the Spirit of God. The doctrine of the Trinity is one of the most distinguishable, if not the most distinguishable part or aspect of the Christian religion. The word Trinity itself is actually not found anywhere in Scripture, but the concept is there all through its pages. 
this concept, right? There's one God, three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Each distinct from one another, each worthy of your praise and adoration, each worthy of glory and honor, but one God. It's a paradox. It's filled with mystery. No matter how much books we have written and will write on it, we will not be able to grasp and comprehend what that means. But nevertheless, it's there in Scripture. And even here in our passage, Jesus uh, turns the attention of the disciples to it. And just as he's been doing all throughout the Gospels, he mentions how he has been doing the work of the Father, right? And we get that relationship. But now, in this passage, he draws attention to the Spirit and tells them, but you will receive a counselor. We are going to send you a helper. There's much to say on the Spirit of God. I really just want to highlight a few things of what, he does. The Spirit helps you when you are in difficult situations and need to bear witness to Christ. The Spirit teaches and reminds you of what you need to know and remember. He is a comforter, an advisor, an encourager. He is your strength. The Spirit draws people to the gospel. He equips you with the strength you need to accomplish God's purposes. The Spirit helps you to put to death the misdeeds of the body. The Spirit helps to set you free from the sins you cannot get rid of on your own. The Spirit reminds you that you are a son and daughter of the Most High God. The Spirit convicts people of sin. The Spirit is one in whom originates love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So why would we not seek him? In this first point, all I'm really drawing attention to is this idea that he's a gift to you. The word that's used, we see counselor, advocate, really the rawest sense of the spirit in this passage is this idea of that he's the one who comes alongside you, the come alongsider. And his job is really to help you in your following of Christ. The problem is receiving help, some of us, is very difficult. I work with nurses at Baylor University, and anyone who works with in healthcare and is a healthcare professional themselves can tell you they're very good at giving help to people. They're terrible at receiving help from others. And very few things cut more deeply into our pride than saying these words to another, I need help. And so right away, I think for some of us, the beginning point is asking God <laughs> to help. Crying out to him to fill you with his spirit. It's a scary thing because we're not sure all too often what that's going to mean, what that's going to entail but you can't grow in spiritual maturity without the Spirit of God. And so that's a starting point for some of us to receive help that God would want to give to you. And that comes in different forms. It might come through a friend. It might come through counsel that you read in literature or that you hear uh, on a news conference or in a uh, religious conference or whatever. It is going to come to you in different ways, all for the sake of drawing your attention to your need for the grace and mercy of God. Receiving his help is going to be difficult because it's going to cut through your pride. But he's been sent to help you grow in your faith. Second point, the Holy Spirit lives in those that put their faith in Christ. This is both an encouraging word and it's going to be a very sobering word as you'll see in a minute. We're reminded in Romans 8, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit. Ephesians 1 and 2 Corinthians 1 remind us that he's a guarantee. He's a deposit 
that the inheritance that belongs to Christ is yours to also share. And that's an encouraging word because I think all too often there can be this message that, hey, if you sin, the Spirit's going to leave. And nowhere in Scripture do we see that idea that he's just going to leave you in some sort of vindictive manner because you've sinned. We're reminded instead that he's a deposit. He's a guarantee that you're going to share all that Christ has. Just as he rose from the dead, you too will rise. The sobering word, however, is that even though those of us who have put our faith in Christ have the Spirit living in us, what many of us have seen in the lives of Christians in the church and what many outside of the church see was a work that seems far removed from what would be the Spirit of God. Brennan Manning, he's an American author and theologian, I share this observation. The number of people who have fled the church because it is too patient or compassionate is small. The number who have fled because they find it too unforgiving is tragic. I think many of us would be surprised if we were to see as God sees and see in whom the Holy Spirit resides. I know even for myself, if I were to really see as he sees, I would be shocked. I'm like, the Spirit lives in that person? I don't, I don't see it. <laughs> They're angry a lot of the time. They're bullies. <laughs> they say mean things. I, I, how is the Spirit of God living in that person? And yet it's there in Scripture that those who put their faith in Christ, the Spirit of God's alive in that person. The challenge, though, is that we're still called to seek him, to keep in step with him. So though we have the Spirit living in us, for many of us, it's an active faith that is absent. It's a very passive relationship that we have with the Spirit of God. And so while he's alive in you, he's ready and raring to go to move you into doing where God wants you to be and where he wants you to go. And whether it be because of fear or pride, or stubbornness, whatever it might be, a hardened heart, we just will not move with him. So yes, the Spirit lives in those that have put their faith in Christ, but the challenge to us is to move in step with him. He's not giving us his spirit. He's not giving you his spirit to just coast through life or to just live a life of constant worry and anxiety, but to live a life in such a way that it draws attention to the beauty and wonder of God. To live a life whereby people can say, there is a God and he's at work in you. That's the work of the Spirit in you. But he's not going to force himself on you, nor is he going to force you to be moving in whatever direction he wants you to go. It's a participatory relationship. And some of you might be convicted this morning. Your heart has been hardened towards him, towards perhaps even forgiving another towards taking a step of faith in a certain direction that you sense he's leading you, towards heeding the counsel of wise men and women that are trying to speak into your life. But you just will not move. You won't listen. So yes, the Spirit of God lives in you, but he's calling you to keep in step with him. Why? because of who he's pointing you to. And in Christ, there's life to be found. The third point, the work of the Holy Spirit is many. We see just a few 
examples here in this passage. He comforts, he counsels, he brings to remembrance what the disciples ought to know. And even here in this section, what he's really drawing attention to is the inspiration of Scripture, right? Gospels haven't yet been written at this point in the story. But he's telling his disciples, you're going to remember all that's happened. And you're going to write it down. So that those that follow after you can know, can believe that this gospel is true. But that is just a part of it, right? It's also reminding us, right, that the Spirit works to continue to bring to your remembrance who God is, how he's worked in your life in the past. So the work of the Spirit is many, but what I think is important for us to see is that it's ultimately about pointing you to Christ. Each member of the Trinity, distinct in what they do, the Spirit constantly drawing attention to the Son. And it's interesting how in this passage, Jesus keeps bringing up this idea of love. If you love me, if you love me, if you love me, do this. If you love me, obey me. If you love me, if you love me. And I wrestled with that. I remember my wife and I were having a conversation recently. How do you grow in love with someone? With a spouse that you're just frustrated with, how do you grow in love with that person? Kids that are frustrating you, siblings that are annoying you, Supervisor, co-workers, that you just can't stand. How do you you love them? How do you grow in love for them? How does such love that Christ is alluding to not become rote or fake or insincere? I'm only going to draw attention to two ways in which we're called to grow in love with Christ. The first is in spending time with him. It's such a simple and yet important message that we are quick to overlook because spending time requires energy and intentionality, and it's exhausting. And yet here, he keeps drawing attention to his word. Spend time with me. Obey my commands, listen to my commands, and we find that in Scripture. Spend time with him and his word. It's this risky thing because right, even as you spend time with him, you're going to interpret it perhaps a different way than I would. You're going to apply it perhaps a different way than I would. But it's a risk worth taking. Why? Because he's given us his word to know him. To know what it looks like to love well as we continue to be drawn to how he's shown us his love at the cross. How he's shown us his love all through history, beginning at creation. So we spend time in his word to come to see what he's been up to and what he's up to going forward. The second way this might sound odd, is to use your gifts. You're in love by using your gifts in service to others. All too often commands, instructions of God, we approach it in the negative. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And we forget to see it in the positive. What are the gifts that God has given to you to enjoy? But in the process, to also draw attention to the joy that's found in God. There's a reason why when we attend a sports event, when we see something amazing, we're drawn to our feet. We attend a music concert, we are in awe at the talent in front of us. When we see a work of art that just astounds us. All the ways in which these gifts are demonstrated draw attention, give us glimpses of the joy of the Lord because it's all from him. (laughs) 
And as followers of Christ, we know this. The Spirit is the one that gives gifts. One of my favorite athletes, Eric Lido, his story is reflected in this movie, Chariots of Fire. He's a 20th century uh, missionary and uh, runner. And he shares this line with his sister on one occasion uh, where he tells her, you know, I know that God's made me for a purpose, but he's also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. And I've always loved that line because it draws attention to loving and enjoying the gifts that God's giving you. Some of you are gifted in education. You're gifted teachers. You're gifted counselors. You're gifted advocates. You're gifted artists and musicians and athletes. It's for your enjoyment. <laughs> but it's also for the sake of service to others. Why? So that they can marvel and wonder at God. So that they can get a glimpse of this God of the universe in whom all good gifts are found. It's not just for your benefit. It's for mine. And my gifts are for your benefit. Why? So we can be wrapped up into this love that the Father has poured out on us. Using our gifts, what an interesting thought. It's for your enjoyment. But then it's also for the sake of of serving others so that it can draw attention to the love of God, to the wonder and majesty of who he is. When we hear these words, listen to my commands, obey my commands, Christ boils it down for us, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, your mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And part of that is serving others. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 gets at this as well. The church in Corinth was a mess. All right. They're struggling with all sorts of sexual issues, with all sorts of division in the church. They're preaching Christ, but they're having a tough time loving each other well. And towards the end of that chapter, he draws attention to the Holy Spirit and the gifts that are theirs. And do you remember how he ends it? All of this is worth nothing if it's not in love. All of this is worthless if it's not for the sake of love. And so we're reminded, even as we're called to follow Christ and the power of the Spirit, that he's gifted you, not so only that you can enjoy it, but so you can love others well. I want to end our time this morning really with this challenge that if the Holy Spirit is not one that you've wrestled with before, I encourage you today and this week to really take time and ask God, have I neglected your spirit? Are there places in my life where you've been trying to get my attention and I'm just not listening. I encourage you to pray that he would send people your way that can wrestle with you. It's hard to do this on your own, and we're reminded you can't do this alone. We need one another. So I would encourage you even to pray that he would send someone to you to help you wrestle with this. I don't know how many of you guys keep up with some of the things that happen in the Middle East, but within uh, many Muslim societies, there's been an interesting phenomenon that's been going on the last several years where many Muslims, faithful to the Quran, are yet still having visions of Isa, of Jesus. And in their vision, what's always being communicated to them, and one of the many things, is seek this person out so that he can tell you more about who I am. And many have been growing in relationship with Christ, many secretly, but it's been growing. The work of the Spirit is mysterious, is multifaceted. It's powerful. But he's moving. He's constantly 
wanting to move you closer to Christ. So my prayer is that we would take that challenge seriously as we continue to seek out this Jesus who is risen, no longer visibly here, but will one day return again. Let's join me in prayer. Father, as we continue through this series with wrestling with what it means to grow in the gospel and what it means to take seriously its commands that we're to lay down our life for the sake of finding it, that we're to pick up our cross, the cross that you would give to us for the sake of finding resurrection that's found in you. Father, we thank you that you've given us your spirit, not just as a deposit, but as a reminder that we cannot do this on our own strength. That the mystery of who you are, although it will confound us and sometimes even trouble us and sometimes even cause us to doubt, yet still moves us to trust you. Lord, there are some here who, when it comes to difficulty, when it comes to trials, when it comes to suffering, they will turn from you. And yet still there are others who will say, Lord, though you slay me, yet still will I trust you. And all of that is the work of the Spirit. So I pray you would fill us, Lord. Fill this congregation with your Spirit. Jesus, give us grace to follow after you. When things are going well, when things are comfortable, but even more so, Lord, when things are going completely against us when there's tragedy all around. Jesus, won't you give us a vision of the hope that is found in you? So I pray you'd encourage us, strengthen us, and continue to give us grace to keep in step with your spirit. It's in Jesus' name, amen. In a moment, we're going to transition into communion, and as the worship team is playing, uh, once more, I invite you to pause um, and to reflect uh, on the ways that the Spirit has been trying to get your attention. And for those who, this is something that just delights them, I encourage you to wrestle with who it is that God's been putting in your heart to really be more intentional with coming alongside. For those that are in Christ, this time is to remind us of the finished work of Christ, his body broken for you, his blood poured out on your behalf for the remission of sins. And so we eat and we drink in remembrance of what he's done for us at the cross. And we do so with hope as we anticipate his return. And when you're ready, come down the middle of the aisle, grab the elements, and then proceed down the end of the aisle. I think we have someone in the back. Yes, Mr. Roman. Uh, for those that are in need of prayer um, with another. And if you're not a follower of Christ, I encourage you to let these elements pass you by. And instead, to seek one out and to continue to ask and to wrestle with this God of Scripture.